Do you suppose we'll hear stories about addiction? We might. Oh. Stories about recovery, too? Hmm, but mostly stories about how addiction turns smart, sensitive people into liars, thieves, gluttons, and whores. Liars? And thieves? And gluttons and whores. Oh, liars, thieves, gluttons, and whores. Oh, my. Liars, liars thieves, thieves, gluttons, gluttons and, whores. and whores. Oh, my. Liars, thieves, gluttons, and whores. Oh, my. Welcome, welcome, welcome. You are on the air with me, Nancy Adair, the host of Liars, Thieves, Gluttons, and Whores, the podcast that brings you stories about the dark and the light side of both addiction and recovery. And today I'm super excited to have with me a uh, guest, Dr. Vince Alberti, and um, I'm going to let him introduce himself to you. Well, thank you very much, Nancy. First of all, it's a pleasure being on this wonderful podcast. And uh, again, my name is Vince Alberti, and uh, I'm someone that uh, has had a, a challenging time through addiction and recovery. However, I found my way, and in short, I'm someone that really is about compassion, kindness, and love, and uh, really giving back to the community to the best of his abilities. Uh, I'm very spiritually focused, and uh, I'm currently the executive director of the Red Deer Dream Center, which is an addiction and recovery center. Um, yeah, yeah. But now that you've said that, Nancy, tell me a little bit about yourself. I am into recovery from alcohol and drugs, also a recovering food addict. So that's part of my draw to this liars, thieves, gluttons, and whores, which I'm not <laughs> sure if you're familiar with that term, but they say addicts are generally liars, thieves, gluttons, and whores. So I may meet all the categories, of, but certainly of a couple of them. And, um, and I'm dedicating my life and this podcast to helping people not only find their way to recovery, to maintain it through all the ups and downs of life. And as you know, there's something that caused us to turn this around. Some people call it the, the bottom that you might have hit. I love one of the 12-step uh, recovery slogans is you can hit bottom anytime you choose to stop digging. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that the truth, eh? So was there a particular time or moment that you knew, Vince, that the gig was up? You know, I, for me, I would have to say December 13, 2003. Yeah. For many years, I, I wanted to, you know, the money side of things. You know, we, I, I didn't grow up in a, in a rich family, but I got caught got up in, in a great deal with the alcohol side of things, not so much drugs. I did drugs with the alcohol, but alcohol predominantly. And December 13, 2003, I'll never forget it. I was uh, I was taking the train back home because I used to live in Chicago. I was there talking to a guy that was making a quarter million dollars in equity analyst, a lawyer making 300,000 American and a guy working at Goldman Sachs making a million bucks a year as a trader. And um, I was making 90 grand back then, which is really good money, right? But to me, it was like, it's really good money nowadays. But the fact of the matter is that I had no idea what the hell I wanted in my life. I was just a mess. And uh, I was looking for ways to just end it all. And uh, for me, it, it was then, December 13, 2003, I lost my job. I got fired. I wanted to, I was walking to get hit by a train, trying to want to end it all. So that was, that was really my low point. Uh, I was just uh, an up and mess. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't get much lower than that. To be fired and to think that you want to step in front of the train instead of on the train, you know, um, to really end it all, which I, the suicide rate related to drugs and alcohol is just... It is pandemic. You know, this podcast is about the dark and the light side, and I don't want to make light of addiction. And yet there are some times, some memories that I'm sure we all have where it was crazy. You know, the things that we would do, not only being someone that was making 90K a year and thinking, you know, I don't feel like I have a purpose or a direction in life. 
what were some of the crazy type things that I did back then? Yeah. Oh, I would, uh, every, every single day I would drink between 16 and 20 beers right after work. I would literally, every day I would take the, the, the train from Wheaton to downtown Chicago and vice versa. And there was a yellow line, right? And every day I was thinking, because I'd hear people jump in front of the train. I'm thinking, it's today the day. It's today the day. I'm walking, it's today the day. Right? I would uh, I would get drunk, get hammered, uh, try the drugs and so forth. And I'd be on the train track at uh, two in the morning. The train didn't even run then. But I'd be walking on the train tracks in the hopes that it would, there was a train there that would, that would hit me and kill me. You know, it's, it's stuff like that. And uh, my mind, I'd always think that everyone was against me. Everyone was against me. There may have been a couple of people here and there, but come on, everybody, right? My moods all over the place. The having access to firearms to end it all, but never pulling the trigger, right? You know, I did the, I got a DUI and, uh, and I got thrown in jail, you know, and, uh, and I said to myself, how dare that person call the cops on me? It was a freaking danger to you, you know what I mean? How dare that person call the cops on me and put me in jail? So stuff, like my thinking was off. I was in the, very obsessive and I just wanted to end it all. But I didn't because of my family, my wife and my kid. Oh, you know, you, I didn't know that part of the story. You know, like, uh, you know, here you are making a good living and drinking 16 20 beers every night and oh by the way i've got a kid and a and a wife at home yeah. you said that you're now the executive director of a treatment program did you go through a treatment program yourself how did you turn this around or begin to turn it around i, be, I began to turn it around i never went through treatment myself my my downfall was like i have a phd i was an academic called canadian my downfall was my ego. I thought I was smarter than this. Uh, but you know something I heard in, a, in an organization that I'm part of right now, there are a lot of, a lot of people, a lot of uh, dead people that are intelligent. And uh, so I, I thought I was too smart. And I'd always use logic and rationale to, to say, oh, you know something, it's, it's not me, it, it's, it's them. It's the other person. You know, I'm good to go. And then... Uh, I joined a couple of organizations, well, one in particular, and I saw the light with regard to my spirituality. I was born, uh, I'm a Christian, but I never really practiced it per se. And I found uh, that higher power to, to really change my life. I mean, everything I do, I do through him and uh, in the community I learned. So if I close my eyes today, I'm good to go, I feel. I've done everything possible to be a good human being, right? As I've turned things around and impact other people. But yeah, that's in short, yeah. Yeah, I thought you were going to say, after you said that you hold a PhD um, and you mentioned that your ego kept you from going into treatment and getting that jump start on recovery, I thought about the 12-step um, slogan, the easing God out. Yeah. You know, that the ego is easing God out of the picture. It also brought to my mind how someone shared with me early on in my recovery that everything that I looked for in drugs and alcohol and food, I needed to find in God. Yes. And I took that very literally. I thought about how I would, you know, I got in a car accident and, you know, would I call AAA? Would I, you know, file a police report? No, I'd go to the the closest convenience store, you know, <laughs> even if I had to walk because the car wasn't running. Um, you know, I just always look to drugs for the answer versus uh, looking to a higher power for the answer. Yes. And I, I worshiped I worshiped my food in particular, or the, the drug of food and the, um, and the alcohol. I, I worshiped it the way that I need to now in my life find another source in worship. So I very much love that a lot of people are resistant to this whole idea of a higher power 
And I think it's because they've been hurt in the past by uh, maybe religious factions that um, they also need to recover from rather than looking at that higher power could be a higher self. The part of us that knew for a long time, this has to stop. And yet we didn't feel like we had the self-efficacy or the, the personal agency to make those changes. So it, it just needs to be that in that way, greater than you, greater than your ego, right? Vince, what are some of the darker moments in recovery? Like, I, I know that recovery doesn't instantly make the entire world better. It does take away that desire to jump in front of the train instead of get on it. With regard to that question, one is the first two years. For some people, they have like a pink cloud. For me, essentially, I couldn't, I just perspired. I just wanted that drink. For some people, they go to detox for seven days, two weeks, three weeks, whatever it is, before they, they go to the treatment center and they're good to go. Whereas myself, I just, I craved it. It was in my body. Even now talking about it, it's on the top of my lips. You know, it's on my tongue, I should say. I really crave that. Even to this day, I crave it. So I really craved that alcohol for the first two years. But then after that, that ego, my ego was too strong. You know, uh, I thought I was the CEO of my life and I had everything, everything was under my control. And giving it up to God was the farthest thing from my mind, right? The logic was, being logical was very, very important to me. But uh, surrendering, which no one really wants to surrender was the greatest gift ever. Nancy, it was the most beautiful thing ever. That's when my ego was just crushed. You know, December 13, 2003, that's when it really started, but that's when it was just crushed. And that's in 2009, it took six years. And it was the best feeling ever. Because then what happened was when it was totally crushed, I found out who who I truly am, who is, I'm not Dr. Vincenzo Aliberti. I'm not my PhD, I'm not my academic, I'm not my, my, my job, I'm not my this, I'm not my that. that, that's all external stuff. Who the hell am I? I'm a God-loving person who cares for people. I'm a person that wants to make a difference in this world before I close my eyes. Everything else is up in noise. Everything else is what other people say. You can have your 50 cars and you can have your this and that. If that makes you happy, more power to you. For me, that's all out there. It was really something transcendental that I experienced where I felt peace. Being connecting to God, my God, and being at peace, being compassionate, kind, and loving to myself, which was very hard. I remember looking at a mirror and I said to myself, do you love yourself? I didn't say anything because I couldn't. But now I can honestly say that I love myself and I love others. Even more so than some people love themselves. So yeah, those are the darkest moments. I heard a podcast between Marie Folier and Mel Robbins not mm -hmm. that long ago. And Mel said that she's been able to completely let go of the inner critic that when she looks in the mirror she not only sees a reflection of herself she sees her soul and she feels the love toward herself that she feels toward her adult children her daughters that was beautiful for me to think about not only, uh, I call it retiring my inner critic, uh, not only putting it on the shelf, uh, being able to love myself as completely as I love my one and only child who is an adult. And, you know, it's just such, there's such love there that it's like to think that you love yourself that completely. It is like 
the love that you feel for your higher power, you know, yes. feel and to feel that you can then bring that to the world, um, be that shining light. So you talked about, you know, the the ego crushing surrender in six years into recovery. And um, what, what has been one of the highlights inside of recovery for you? I'd say my connection with my, my God, number one, but number two, uh, rather than forcing everything, what I've realized is, you know, this is the way I'm going to do it. This is this is my plan, and these are the outcomes that I'm going to have next next day, thirty days, sixty days. I get it. I'm a planner. I want to get stuff done. You get it. I get it. It's more about letting things happen organically. And one thing that I wanted to do was pay testament. Uh, testament. My mother was a schizophrenic, and she. She had mental health concerns, right? And to pay a tribute to her through my talking. So I do talking. I'm an impact speaker with the United Way, right? And little by little, what happened is that I'm getting all this because of my own recovery, because of my own spirituality, because of me publishing my books. What's happening is that my, my true, the true version of myself is coming out even more so. And I noticed that it's leading me to the path of helping others in the, the mental health arena, not just addictions and recovery, mental health. And this is an arena that I can see myself working for the rest of my life until I close my eyes. I think that you know, tremendous, like everything that's happened in my life happened for a reason. And now is the time to take everything so that I can have a conversation with Nancy Adair on this podcast and hopefully impact one person or with the Red Deer Dream Center here in Red Deer. And we have, it's a 40 men facility that's opening up in June, on June 1st, make an impact to those 40, those 40 men and their families. Uh, it's much greater than a paycheck. It's, it's making a difference in life, right? And that's a huge shining light and, and paying testimony to my mother that's also very important to me as well, right? Yeah. It's not about me is basically what I'm trying to say. It's, it's, it's about the community at large. Everything else is just noise. Yeah. I love it. So is there anything um, that you would like the listeners to know specifically from you? Like uh, I'm thinking along the lines of a tip for recovery or how to start, take the first step, what would you have to offer to the listeners today? If you think you have a problem or even considering, because a lot of people don't want to admit it, take that first step. Whether there's detox, treatment center, seeing a psychologist, if you're a shaman, whatever case, priest, whomever, just see someone and just have a discussion. Everything begins with a conversation. But of all, above all, realize that there's a lot of embedded trauma that people that, are, that have mental health, addiction and recovery issues, addiction, addiction issues, it's important to understand that it's much deeper than the we give our credit. So along with taking that first step, just realize that you're human. And even if you don't believe in a higher power, be compassionate, kind, and loving to yourself. Patient, tolerant with yourself. Because this is not something that can be solved in one day. Be patient, be compassionate, kind, loving to yourself, and uh, yeah, just take it one step at a time because this is not... Uh, a one day journey. This is something that uh, that's going to be uh, a journey that's going to be transformational in nature. But you need to want to have be part of that journey. And it's up to you. Create your own journey because this could, like me, 
you know, it just transformed my life. And I'm hoping that it transforms yours because every journey is different for every person. Yeah. That's wonderful, Vince. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. Oh, my, the pleasure's all mine. And Nancy, you have a wonderful smile. And thank you once again for, for inviting me to be a guest on your podcast. Yes. You're welcome. Do you suppose we'll hear stories about addiction? We might. Oh. Stories about recovery, too? Mm, but mostly stories about how addiction turns smart, sensitive people into liars, thieves, gluttons, and whores. Liars? And thieves? And gluttons and whores. Oh, liars, thieves, gluttons, and whores. Oh, my. Liars, thieves, gluttons, and whores. Oh, my. Liars, thieves, gluttons, and whores. Oh, my.